And Jonathan Liss is a political commentator. They're here to take your calls. Lots of them coming in already, but do keep trying if you can't get through. 0345 6060 973. And of course, you can watch us on Global Player. On your radio, on Global Player. And play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, an Islamic State group supporter will be sentenced on Wednesday for murdering the Conservative MP Sir David Amis. Ali Harbi Ali, who's 26, has been convicted at the Old Bailey of the knife attack in Essex last October. Brendan Cox, the widower of murdered Labour MP Joe Cox, says the crimes only achieved a much wider awareness of the decency of Sir David and the causes he championed. These attacks aren't going to, while they'll hurt us, and they obviously, for the families involved, they're, uh, they're absolutely awful, they won't damage and they won't undermine our democracy and in fact will try to make it stronger as a result. A Tory MP found guilty of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy has been thrown out of the party. A lawyer for Imran Ahmad Khan, who represents Wakefield, says he plans to appeal as soon as possible, following the case at Southwark Crown Court. The Austrian Chancellor has described his meeting in Moscow today with Vladimir Putin as very direct, open and tough. Karl Nehammer says he raised the issue of serious war crimes committed by the Russian military. P&O Ferries has resumed passenger services between Ken Ryan and Larne, despite saying yesterday tourist sailings on the Scotland-Northern Ireland route wouldn't restart until Thursday, but its ships won't be running between Dover and Calais until at least Good Friday. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed down 51 points at 76.18, the pound buys $1.30 and €1.19. LBC weather, rain overnight and windy in the north. Tomorrow, showery rain for many, but some bright warm spells across parts of the south with a high of 18. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Andy Ivey. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Cross Question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's Cross Question on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's one minute past eight. We have one of the best looking panels we've ever had on the programme, which is an incentive for you to watch us on Global Player. You can see if my judgment is absolutely correct because we have former Labour Home Secretary Jackie Smith with us, co-presenter of the For The Many podcast. Emma Wolfe is a broadcaster, journalist and author. Annabel Denham is Director of Communications at the Institute for Economic Affairs. And Jonathan Liss is a political commentator. They're going to give you their words of wisdom on all the questions, all the wonderful questions that you're going to be asking over the next hour. If you'd like to come on the programme, it's 0345 6060 973. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. The first question comes from David on a text. It says, what is the IEA? Is it the Institute for Erotic Art, perhaps? <laughs> Could you clear that up, Annabelle? <laughs> Delighted to, Ian. Thank you. It's the Institute of Economic Affairs. Well, there you go. Oh, I never know whether to say of or for, but I think I got it wrong, didn't I? Right, let's go to the first real question. It's from Vicky in Hounslow. Hello, Vicky. Hi, good evening, Ian. Hi. Um, so, hi. The question I have for the panel is, um, following the solution that Boris Johnson can take Chancellor was holding a green card, had a London wife and in laws who conducted business with Vladimir Putin. A trip to the Ukraine seems like Sorry, a power I, play. I couldn't understand a word of that because the line is terrible. We'll get you back on the line in just a second. Let's go to David in Enfield. Hello, David. Good evening, everybody. Um, Hi. Does the panel think that all government ministers should be required to publish their annual tax returns? together with an audited statement of assets and liabilities. I'm asking this in the context of the, the SUVID, the uh, Sunak Javid the controversy. Um, Annabel Denham, do you think that all politicians, all ministers should publish their tax returns? I think that all ministers should be subject to the same requirements as workers across our economy. I don't see why there should be a different rule for them than there is for the rest of us, though we've seen plenty of that throughout the coronavirus pandemic this certainly seems to be a story that has got legs it's running on and on and it's becoming increasingly uncomfortable for the chancellor of the exchequer the moves that he's made in the last few days seem to be 
making the situation worse than they do better. Um, but yeah, that's that's ultimately. Of course, in America, the, certainly the president and presidential candidates publish their tax returns. I don't Trump know. never did. Actually, you're right, he didn't, did he? No, but, it's not but I don't know whether senators or members of the House of Representatives have to. Jonathan? I don't think that we need to go to the extent of publishing tax returns. What I do think is that there should be a lot more transparency in general over ministers' income. And we saw with the whole Owen Paterson scandal a few months ago that there is a real public appetite to clamp down on ministers' uh, outside income. I think there's a widespread... MPs, ministers can't... Sorry, yes, of course, sorry, ministers, MPs, uh, sorry, uh, outside income. I think there is a, there's a widespread appetite to clamp down on second jobs. When it comes to ministers, I think that certainly their tax status and the history of their tax status should be uh, in the public domain as you know as as Javid and Sunak have and and their families have done I do think that the spouse is also you know absolutely necessary because it's should part this of your be family all ministers, income even junior ministers or just cabinet ministers I mean uh, I think obviously there'd have to be a series of rules but the the fundamental so the fundamental principle, if you like, is that if you are involved in setting up policy, there should be total transparency over your private interests and affairs. I think that should be uh, agreed by all sides of the political spectrum. Chucky? Well, we discussed this on the For the Many podcast this weekend, didn't we, Ian? And came, I think, to the correct conclusion that publishing your tax returns somehow or another had a slightly un-British feel about it. So I don't think that um, politicians should be expected to do that. But as Jonathan says, uh, one of the difficulties in this situation is uh, it doesn't feel to me as if Rishi Sunak has been completely open in terms of his declarations of interest about the tax situation that his wife was in. And if you're the Chancellor of the Exchequer and you are making decisions about non-DOM status with respect to taxation, and it isn't clear to everybody who's scrutinising those decisions that your family will be benefiting but, potentially. But to be fair to him, he hasn't made any of those decisions, has he? No, but There's he... There's been no reforms that he's introduced. I think he put forward, as I understand it, he put forward as part of the finance bill proposals around non-DOM status. And of course, that it's his job to make decisions about the tax treatment uh, of those with a non-DOM status. And because he chose to, you know, he says, oh, well, I made all the declarations that I should have done. But it's a strange ministerial declaration that only the most senior civil servants know about and that when the public gets to know about it, you have to launch a leak inquiry because you didn't really want everybody to know about it in the first place. If you're declaring your interests, it's so that everybody can see that you're not acting in a way that benefits you or your family's interests and he's failed that test. Emma Wolf. <laughs> okay, let's be clear. He's done nothing illegal, but it's extremely ethically and morally dubious. It's extremely slippery behaviour that we've been seeing from Rishi Sunak and I think his career is over. I don't think he's going to save his skin. Clearly knows he's done something not particularly to be proud of because otherwise why would his wife have changed her mind why would he be and is anyone else irritated out there that we are now going to be paying for lord guite's time and resources and expenses what's no what, doubt what, what he's there for to well promise. fine but why are we why is he <laughs> being twiddling his thumbs <laughs> that's fine by me he can twiddle his actually, thumbs actually at the moment why i don't we... think he is twiddling his thumbs but... well, no i think he's got quite a lot on his plate but um what why are we why is rishi sunak uh, you know nominating himself to be investigated by the the independent ethics advisor at you know considerable expense to us to, to to try and clear Rishi Sunak's name when it's his own family's affairs that we are I mean it's unprecedented for a chancellor to be moving his belongings I know he didn't live very much at number 11 anyway but for his belongings to be moved out of number 11 I think he'll be in California, you know, running Facebook very soon. I don't see him absolutely <laughs> fighting with Nick Clegg. Absolutely. Fighting with Nick Clegg. He will never, he will never become <laughs> Prime Minister now. <laughs> well, I think that's quite an interesting point. Do any of you think that his political career now has effectively come to a halt? Can he recover from this? I don't think he can recover. I think it's curtains for him. It's just, I think that some politicians are incredibly lucky and they convince themselves it's talent. Uh, Rishi Sunak came to the Exchequer just before COVID and then he was responsible for an extremely popular policy as soon as reality comes to light as soon as he has to make political judgments he's been completely exposed. And the timing of this this is mm. we are facing a real Absolutely. cost of living crisis people are genuinely choosing between heating and eating they're genuinely worried about supermarket prices and you have someone who 
I know it's not fair to judge people just because they're wealthy, but he's, you know, worth, what, 200 million himself, billions his wife is worth. This cannot... People do really feel this, don't they? They really feel that I th I think he you're is out of touch. You're, you're right. People judge um, chancellors who... Um, benefit. Cutting twenty pounds off people's it, universal credit exactly. that matters to them. They judge chancellors who aren't recognising a cost of living increase in the way in which you've you've said and, and, and appear to have double standards. In the same way as they judge prime ministers who party whilst they're locked down because of COVID regulations. These are, these things are very hard for the public to stomach. And for that reason, I, to answer your question, Ian, no, I think his ambition, his clear ambitions to be prime minister are probably over now. Um, David, let's come back to you. Um, I don't think any of our panel really agree with you that everyone, every minister should publish their tax returns. Why do you think they should? Well, well I totally disagree because, um, I mean, the two fundamental principles of... Um, democracy, our transparency and accountability. And these ministers are not normal in, in, in employees. They're public servants funded by our taxes making our laws. And I think we should have total transparency as to what vested interests they may hold that may affect the type of legislation that they, they introduce. I think it's 100% necessary. Jackie? Well, but, that, but that's a different point. I, I agree with you about that, but you don't achieve that by publishing your tax returns. You achieve that by having a strong process of declaring your interests and those of your immediate family. And it's that that I'm not convinced that Rishi Sunak okay. has done in this particular case. David, thanks for your call. Let's uh, go back to Vicky, who's hopefully on a better line. Vicky, what's your question, please? Hi, good evening. Um, so following the revolution that Boris Johnson's handpicked chancellor was holding a green card, his, not, his wife was non-dom uh, status, and his in-laws conducted business with Vladimir Putin, to the Ukraine seems like a power play to fix his reputation and detract from the Partygate scandal. Does the panel agree Johnson can repair neither his image nor our trust in this using this one singular act? <laughs> wow. Um, Jackie. Um, well, to the first part of your question, Vicky, um, you know, part of me thinks that the Prime Minister might actually be quite pleased that the shine has come off Rishi Sunak. I mean, there is an even a question mark about whether or not the leak of his tax arrangements came from number 10 in the first place. I didn't say it, did he? And I just said there was a question mark about whether or not it did. Um, so uh, I, I think on the second part of your question, no, I don't think the Prime Minister can escape the inevitable criticism that has arisen, that I think will continue to arise, about the leadership that he showed within Number 10 in respect to parties over the course of the COVID pandemic. I think he was right to go to Ukraine. Um, and, you know, I think much of what he's done in terms of our policy with respect to Ukraine has been right. But it's not enough to overcome the fact that I think he shouldn't be the Prime Minister and neither do lots of other people. But if at the end of, uh, I mean, I say the end of Partygate, we haven't reached the end of Partygate yet, but before the invasion of Ukraine, you could, if you said his leadership was at an all-time low in the polls, do you think that he started to climb the hill of popularity again? <laughs> well, you mean, has he come out of the depths of the valley? Um, well, because in the end, voters make a decision at election time. that they, they balance up all the different things that a prime minister has done, the good and the bad, and come to a conclusion. Now, I would say he's in a better position today than he was six weeks ago. I agree about that. Um, but I think in the end, what voters will make a decision on is how they feel about their, the cost of living crisis and what the, the money in their pocket. And pocket, he yeah. has presided over a low growth, high tax economy. And in the end, voters will not be impressed by that, I don't think. Jonathan Lewis. Well, um, as you know, Ian, uh, I'm quite sceptical when it comes to uh, the Prime Minister and his motives in you general. You well, <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, I agree that he was right to go to Kiev, obviously, and right to show support for Zelensky. It's a pity that there wasn't more, hasn't been more support shown to Ukrainian refugees, but that's a slightly different issue. Um, but yes, uh, clearly he has always got his eye on his uh, career and his prospects. And uh, to, that extent, to that extent, to that extent, uh, mm. the Ukrainian invasion has been very you know sort of 
Lucky for him, I suppose, in that he was six weeks ago facing an almost certain end to his career and now he's enjoyed a slight bounce. But the polls still show a healthy Labour lead for the most part. Um, there's a narrative developing a lot among a lot of Conservative backbenchers that he's been rescued. But that is not the opinion that, has, that it seems to be shared by the British public. And I think that the important thing is that there are some Prime Ministers who the public makes up their mind about at some particular point. The public, in a way, they never really made up their mind about Thatcher or Blair. They did make their minds up about um, Gordon they Brown. About, about Gordon, about Gordon, they made The public made up its mind about Gordon Brown, for example, and Theresa May and John Major. And after once they'd made up their minds, they never unmade those minds. So they, those, those premises never recovered fully. And I think the same is true of Johnson. Uh, the public seems to have made up its mind about the, the Prime Minister. And I don't think that it, it would be unprecedented for him to come back from from the depths of polling that he was experiencing Even a couple of months ago. there was a poll out this afternoon that showed that Keir Starmer still has a negative approval rating. I mean, it's not as negative as Boris right, Johnson's, right. but, I mean, that's not a good place for an opposition to be at this it's, point it's, in the electoral it's, cycle. It's not great, but I think that this is probably as good as it gets for Johnson, because you've had, you, obviously, you had the terrible Party 8 um, story, which is not finished. Mm -hmm. Sue Gray has not actually released her report yet. There was a, there was a summary. Uh, really, nothing of substance has come out yet, and it will, and there will be fireworks when it does, undoubtedly. And we still have don't... Have seen it? How do you know there'd be fireworks? Well, because well, because there were enough fireworks in the in the pricey and that was kind of like sort of quite quite anodyne. So There were enough fixed penalty notices. Right, exactly. And, and the fixed penalty notices have not yet finished. You know, Cressa Dick was, was hinting at that the other day. So we, this story is still going to run. And Ukraine, the, you know, the invasion has happened. There was the initial boost and it seems unlikely that he okay. can sustain that. And so I think that, you know, uh, Johnson is as good as it gets and the economy is going to get worse. So I don't think his career can be saved. Emma Wolfe. No, I think, I really disagree. I think Boris has rehabilitated himself remarkably. And, you know, no, think back to January. Think back to Sunak flying high, the golden boy, prime minister in waiting, all of that. And Boris Johnson was fighting for his life. He was fighting for political survival. And now there he is striding through, striding through Kiev as war, practically a war hero with Zelensky. I think that Boris Johnson is back on top and I think that he may well win the next election. Well, he's had a good war, hasn't he? As they used to say. Well, he's had a, it's he terrible. hasn't been fighting a war. I mean, is, <laughs> I, it, is, is it very easy to be a war leader when you're not actually thank at you, war? Thank you, I do understand that he's only there for, <laughs> for half a day. To, to, to do you understand Morris's that? Hero, give them the tools and they can finish the job. <laughs> but he wanted to be Winston Churchill all along, and this is his moment. And I'm really, I mean, I'm amazed because during Partygate, I thought that he was over. I thought his you know, career was over. And I think that he has come back. And I think people don't care about Partygate now. The sense is not that people care about Partygate okay. as much as they care Amanda. about Sunak. I think it's a question of who he's redeeming himself to, because let's not forget six weeks ago we were talking about a leadership challenge. Uh, that looked like a very realistic prospect before Putin sent tanks into Ukraine. Now I think we need to look longer term past the May elections in which the Conservatives may be f decimated um, to what's going to happen in 2024, which is the likely date of the next general election if the 1p reduction in income tax that's scheduled for 2024 is anything to go by and that will be a question in my view at least of how uh, the, how the cost of living crisis is going, how the NHS backlog is going. These are the issues that people care about. If they feel as though they are getting wealthier, uh, that the sunlit uplands are somewhere on the horizon, well, then they to. will vote. No, well, I think it's extremely unlikely. I agree with you, Ian. Um, then they will forget Partygate and vote on those issues because fundamentally, I believe that it's still the economy stupid. It depends on how people... Uh, feel about the prospects for the country, about the prospects for their own household finances. And if those are improving, then Boris Johnson will be redeemed regardless of... of quick, retort, quick retort from you, Vicky. I just feel that as far as um, the lead up to all of these um, revolutions of his, his lies in state, Boris Johnson's past um, reputation, even from when he was before Prime Minister, making the massive mistake of um, saying words that landed someone into an Iranian prison. This man has a track record of bad decisions and just deception all around to then put him back into power following a massive massive just fail when it comes to finding sincerity in the way that he leads. It, it would just baffle me that we would just then succumb to another term with someone who cannot even, okay. you know, organize a, a, <laughs> a 
He's too good at organising well, parties. Well, that's yeah, the problem. Yeah, that's yeah. He actually could organise well, one so, theory. That's the problem. <laughs> um, just to be completely factual, he didn't land Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe in prison. She was already in prison, but I think he certainly didn't help in terms of getting her release. Vicky, thank you very much indeed. 0345 6060973 is the number to call if you'd like to put a question to Jackie Smith, Emma Wolf, Annabel Denham, and Jonathan Liss. It's 18 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 21 minutes past eight is the time. I'm tempted to ask the next question on what you just said there, Emma, on beard phobia, but I won't. Hoganophobia. Because we have got a wonderful question from Robbie in Streatham. Hello, Robbie. Uh, good evening, Ian. Uh, before Hi. I actually go into the question, which I'll di direct to Emily Wolf, I'd like to say that. Um, it's ironic that uh, the gentleman that killed David Amos is being convicted at the moment because uh, there was an MP who was well worthy of running our country, I think. Although I'm not a Lib Dem supporter, I think that everything that's ever been said about him um, you know, speaks well, he wasn't for itself. A, he, he wasn't a Lib Dem, by the way. He was a Conservative. Oh, was he really? Well, in which case, yes. then. Sorry, I'm sorry Quite about that. One. Sorry for my ignorance. No, 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 not at all. But I, I always correct people when they, when, when mistakes come up because I then get a load of texts and tweets saying, why didn't you correct them? So I don't, no. didn't wish to be impolite, Robbie. No, no, thank you very much for correcting me. Obviously, I wasn't on the ball. Um, but What's anyway, your question, my question please? to Emily Wolf. Emma. 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 Emma Wolf. Is um, sorry to correct you again. <laughs> oh, right, okay, I'm good to, not doing very well. Um, <laughs> at the time, the military uh, intelligence services knew that Putin was going towards the Ukraine border with his tanks. I can't understand why they went to Putin to ask him what he was doing. Why did they, they world powers, not just fly in all the military hardware necessary? right, uh, into Ukraine, like planes and all the heavy-duty uh, military hardware to repel Putin in case he entered. And I guarantee you, in that particular instance, Putin would never have rolled one tank into Ukraine. OK. Um, I'm not quite sure why that question is directed to you, Emma, but we will put it to the rest of the panel as well. Um, far away. OK, well, I'll have a go, but I'm not, uh, I'm not privy to this... Um international uh, military secret information that you <laughs> that you seem to think I am um, it's a it's a terrible situation and I am afraid I feel that Putin is completely unhinged and out of control the, the atrocities that he's committing in Ukraine are beyond the pale I'm that unfashionable thing which is called a pacifist 
And I know people don't do that anymore, but I think that all military violence, I think all of this is absolutely horrendous. And I think we need to find some way to make it stop. I don't think we should be... I don't think we should be spending billions on killing people, whether they're Russian or Ukrainian. That's, so you you that's, don't think that we should be su supporting the Ukrainians we have in the way to, that we well, are? Now, now that we're in this position, of course, we have to support Ukraine, you know, but, but every day this goes on. Every day this goes on, there are children and women and, well, people, human beings being killed on both sides. <coughs> well, there aren't women and children being killed on the Russian side, are there? The no. Russians are doing the killing of the women and children. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are yeah. human beings losing their yeah. lives on both sides. Uh, you know, and you know, it's not that I don't. Pe people seem to not care about Russian soldiers. I do. I mean, uh, young men on both sides being killed is an absolute. It's just a complete waste of human life. Uh, Annabelle. Well, I think it's fair to say that we didn't anticipate, we, the Western Alliance, did not anticipate how far Vladimir Putin would go with this war. And indeed, I think Vladimir Putin himself has been taken aback by the resistance that he's seen from the Ukrainian forces and perhaps the lack of willingness um, and lack of welcome that he's had uh, in certain regions of Ukraine. So I think that the first thing to say is that nobody really expected uh, things to go as far as they have and to escalate as quickly as they have, which perhaps explains why it is that we didn't send more weaponry to the border, more troops to the border with Ukraine. But of course, the, the other side of this is that Russia is a nuclear power mm. and we have to be extremely careful about getting, or well, the US in particular, about getting into a shooting war with a nuclear power. And as Emma says, Putin has, has shown himself to, to be an irrational political actor for a long time. I think we thought that he was a rational political actor who, to some degree, could be reasoned with. Um, but the extent of, uh, of this war um, suggests that he isn't. So I think it's a combination of needing to uh, apply some caution. Of course, we've, we, the West, have gone further than was expected as well. We've imposed economic sanctions that certainly I wasn't uh, anticipating, um, such as blocking access to SWIFT, um, and some of the sanctions that have been imposed on Russian banks and Russian oligarchs. So I think we're responding appropriately. Some of it is gesture politics, but gestures matter when there's a war on. So I think we're responding to a situation that's moving very, very quickly um, and one that we didn't anticipate going as far as it has. Jonathan. I suppose the first thing to say about this is that in the run-up to the war, it would have been a PR gift to Putin to have troops flooding, not into Ukraine, obviously, but to the border and to have uh, sort of, you know, mass... I think the caller is suggesting that they should have gone into Ukraine at that point. Right, OK, well, I, I, don't think, I don't think that would have been uh, appropriate at that moment. I think it would have been the Russians would have seized on it to say, look at how aggressive the West is being, we need to defend ourselves, etc. So it's kind of a catch-22. But the more important point, I suppose, is that I don't think it would have stopped Putin from invading any Anyway, because this wasn't about NATO or anything. That's just a complete smokescreen. This was about a 19th century style imperial war of aggression in which uh, a revanchist, irredentist leader, an ethno-nationalist, um, decided that he wanted to take back a country that used to belong to his country. Uh, I think that's why this war is so kind of easy to understand to people. I think that's why it sort of hit uh, a nerve with so many people because it's so easy to understand. It's such a, a clear such a clear historic wrong uh, that has been perpetrated and I don't think it could have been prevented by Western actions. And Jackie, given the fact that the intelligence for once was actually <coughs> bang on here, what, what, was America and, and Europe in, in particular a little bit tardy in the response? Uh, almost certainly, yes. But can I just first of all say, Jonathan, what a splendid set of adjectives for uh, to describe Putin there. I think people will be rushing to their political science oh, books in order, to, uh, in order to look those up. Um, not only were um, we tardy in our action, in, we were even more tardy than Robbie is suggesting, because in some ways, of course, the writing was on the wall in 2014 when um, uh, Crimea was annexed in Ukraine. So essentially, Ukraine has been partially occupied uh, since then. But for understandable reasons, as Annabelle said, you know, in uh, it was the it is the case that this is the first war that is being fought since the Cold War, well, the Cold War wasn't a war by definition, between 
um, those who potentially have uh, nuclear weapons. So Russia has nuclear weapons. For NATO to have taken the sort of action that Robbie is implying here would have been potentially enormously risky at the time. It's clear that something more should have happened than did, but I, I think it would have been incredibly dangerous to put NATO... Um, weapons so directly into Ukraine at the point at which Rob is suggesting. Do you think that's changed now, though, that we are in, now in a different ball game? In, unfortunate mm. zone of phrase, maybe, but we're in a different um, part of the conflict where, given we weren't, even if Russia had invaded, I think most of us thought they would behave like an invader would behave rather than commit the kind of atrocious war crimes they have. D does that make any difference to what we should be doing now? Well, we, we also discussed this as well, didn't we, at the weekend, Ian? And, um, I, we have nothing better to I, do about weekends. <laughs> I think there is a distinction between the provision of considerably more weapons and more offensive weapons than we've provided up until this point. And I think that's what we should be doing. I think it's interesting in Germany that you're seeing the gre the, a, a little bit of a split, actually, between the Greens and, uh, the, and Schultz, the Social Democrat leader, about the Germans also providing more uh, weaponry. But that's a different kettle of fish to saying, let's say, we should be sending sending forces directly into um, Ukraine. But I think all of us have been horrified by the way in which Putin has wholly failed. I mean, in one way we shouldn't be because he has always failed to recognise the, the rules of international law and the basic decency of the world order. Um, but, um, and therefore needs to be, uh, therefore needs to be stopped. More of your questions to come, 0345 6060 If you want to watch us, you can do so on Global Player. It's half past eight. Let's get the LBC News headlines with Andy Ivey. Essex police say the two unarmed officers who tackled the killer of Conservative MP Sir David Amis have been given a bravery award. Ali Harby Ali has been found guilty at the Old Bailey of his murder last year and preparing for tax acts of terrorism. The Wakefield MP Imran Ahmad Khan has been expelled from the Conservative Party after he was convicted of sexually assaulting a teenage boy. The victim, who's now 29, was forced to drink alcohol at a house in Staffordshire before he was attacked in 2008. Austria's Chancellor has become the first EU leader to meet the President of Moscow of Russia since Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine in February. Karl Nehammer says the talks didn't leave him optimistic and an offensive in eastern Ukraine is evidently being prepared on a massive scale. LBC weather, rain overnight and windy in the north. Tomorrow, showery rain for many, but some bright warm spells across parts of the south, a high of 18 degrees. This is LBC. Watching.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.33 on Cross Question. Jackie Smith is here. Emma Wolfe, broadcaster, journalist and author. Annabel Denham, Director of Communications at the IEA and political commentator Jonathan List. Did you know, like how I assumed that everyone would know who you were? without telling them. Oh, you know. yes, thanks. Right, let's go to our next question. It's Khaled in Wimbledon. Hello, Khaled. Good evening, Ian, and good evening, panel. Hi. If a, a by-election is held in the constituency of Wakefield, which is Red Wall, and the Conservatives were to lose, would that mean it's toast for Boris Johnson's premiership? Now, the context for this is that a sitting Conservative MP has been found guilty of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old today in, in, at Southwark Crown Court. Now, he's appealing that, so let's all be mindful of that, I guess. But if he is um, sentenced to a, a, a prison sentence and the judge has warned that he might well be, that would cause a by-election. Now, um, single by-elections, Jonathan, List actually don't mean an awful lot, do they? I think some of them can be more important than others, obviously. And this one, if it does take place, uh, will be uh, what we, we might call box office because it's so much... Uh, will hinge on it for both main leaders. Uh, if Boris Johnson loses this, it is going to take him right back to where he was a couple of months ago with a lot of MPs. Because let's let's forget, let's not forget, um, that Tory MPs uh, are entirely ruthless in their calculations. They will keep Boris Johnson if they think uh, he can possibly keep their seats for them. If they don't think that he is best placed to do that, then they'll dispatch him. That's that's literally the only calculation. And so if Johnson... Well, there's one caveat to that. If there's there anyone else who can... be a better alternative. Right, right, exactly. And that's why it's convenient for Johnson that Sunak is now out of the picture. And that's why, you know, expect some negative headlines about Liz Truss in the next couple of months if uh, if number 10 is as Machiavellian as, as they might well be. Uh, but the point is that if Johnson shows that he can't hang on to the seats the Tories won in 2019, that is going to sort of set the balance quite firmly against him for a lot of backbenchers. And so that might expedite his removal before the next election. But on the other hand, it's very, very important for Keir Starmer to win this. It's it's a must win for him because if he can't win Wakefield, uh, which was, you know, a solid Mary Labour seat, seat. Mary Cray's seat. Mary seat. If he can't win that, uh, which which obviously Labour lost in 2019, then Labour is going nowhere near she's power. she's on this programme in, in about a week's time. Well, you can ask her, what, obviously, what she, what she thinks talking, about it. it. But <laughs> if Starmer can't win this, then he can't be Prime Minister. And so I'd expect him to kind of go back to where he was, as sort of say, six or nine months ago, if he can't win this. And that's why it's an absolute must win uh, for both leaders. Emma. I don't think, uh, yeah, Keir Starmer is just a nobody. He's an absolute nobody. Half of the British public think he's called Keith Starmer, don't they? Well, on and Twitter, the, maybe. And the, the, <laughs> the other half don't know who he is. Um, so I think while the opposition is just so woefully weak, there's just, they've had open goal after open goal for months and months and months. I'm just staring at two Labour people. Um, they've had they've had months of open, well, a couple of years of open goal. She didn't mean me, by the way. <laughs> and they have, they have failed to score, and I think that Keir Starmer is... And nothing. Well, they did blank. score over Partygate. I mean, Labour had a massive really. lead. Well, they not had a really. massive lead in the polls. So they still did. Goal. Yeah, fine, but they, 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 it was an open goal. Yeah, they you, scored. You can only they play scored. What got. Yeah, no, but, exactly. Yeah. Amanda. I, Annabelle. I Annabelle. Why, where did Amanda come from? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he didn't, I mean, he did respond, I don't know which was more worried, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we can't read too much into by-elections. I agree with Jonathan's point that the relationship that Boris Johnson has with a lot of Red Wall MPs is purely transactional. They don't believe that he can win for them as the fantastic political campaigner that many of them seem to believe him to be in 2024. Then they could start to turn against him. But I don't think a by-election is what's going to cinch it. And, I mean, if you look at what happened in Cheshire and Marisham, for instance... It meant more, I think, to people like me who are in favour of planning reform than it did to the Conservative Party. Jackie, put your name right. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I mean, I agree with, with everything apart from Emma's comment about Keir Starmer. Um, th th that, that peerage is still <laughs> dangling, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I mean, the point here is, and, and, and we were sort of touching on this earlier on, Boris Johnson is an immensely lucky politician. Um, even were there to be a by-election loss, I'm not sure it would be the end of him. And equally, Keir Starmer has been a very unlucky politician. Let's not forget, it was pretty difficult to be the leader of the opposition during the course of the pandemic. Just as the pandemic was ending and Labour was beginning to set their stall out and Keir Starmer was getting a bit more recognition, we then find ourselves in a position where 
the war in Ukraine starts. And on the whole, rightly, I think, the opposition have tended to lay off the Prime Minister whilst that's been happening. So what would you rather have, a lucky politician or an unlucky politician? Because going into an election, lucky politicians mm. often do rather well. I'd rather have a lucky Labour politician if that's on well, the Well, everyone's table. luck runs out on the end, and you know that. Yeah, you read your Greek tragedy. Who was it who said nothing is forever? <laughs> Kevin's, no, let's do that one. Um, right, Khalid, thank you very much for your question. Let's move on to Annie in Carnforth. Hello, Annie. Hello, Ian and panel. Hi. Um, hi. I'm, me and my partner are disabled uh, pensioners, and today our pensions and disability benefits went up by 3.1%, and inflation is at 6.2%, and forecast to go up to 9 or 10% later on in the year. Um, and the Tories... Um, promised in their manifesto that they would keep the triple lock on pensions which they've ditched this year um, do the panel think that um, the government are doing enough to help people with the cost of living crisis Annabelle uh, no, I don't think the government is doing enough to help you with the cost of living crisis. I think for a start, it ought to have uh, indexed linked welfare benefits to inflation uh, at the spring statement. Uh, I don't think that there should have been any uh, increase in national insurance contributions on both the employee and the employer side. The latter is often forgotten about, but it acts as a disincentive to job creation, really affects people who are not in work, particularly young people and uh, some women as well um, and it's not doing anything to try and tackle the government interventions that have driven up the cost of living for a lot of people so if you look at the energy and security strategy that came out uh, last week there was a lot of longer term planning around nuclear and renewables but still no real encouraging signs on ending the moratorium on fracking and if we want to bring down energy bills then that would be uh, the quickest way of doing it um, so no I don't think the government is taking the cost of living crisis seriously enough. It's not bringing in the sorts of measures that are going to drive it down. And, you know, people, unfortunately, in the next 12 months are going to, many people in the next 12 months are going to feel poorer than they do today. Jackie Smith. Um, no, I don't think the government is doing enough. The um, Rishi Sunak's spring statement, of course, happened at a time when uh, it was clear that we're going to face the biggest hit in living standards this year than we have done for very, very many uh, years in the sort of living memory of very many politicians. And um, the, the proposals that he put forward were simply not up to the task. Um, the important point, I think, about the fact that, you know, he could very easily at the, at the least have reinstated the uplift on universal credit and chose not to. Uh, he didn't find other ways to support people who are clearly facing um, real terms decreases in their uh, living standards at the moment. And that's part of the reason why the shine has gone off him. But more importantly, it's part of the reason why people across the country are having such a difficult time at the moment. Emma? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with basically everything that's been said thus far. I don't think the government have done nearly enough in any sense of the word. Um, you know, whether that be uh, food prices, whether that be fuel and energy, whether that be what the, you know, benefits and pensions. I think it's absolutely horrendous that in 2022, we are seriously, people like Martin Lewis of Money Supermarket, who is now a campaigner as well as, you know, is talking, is having to issue advice on his website about heating the human not the home that we are in this position where people literally are going to have to you know w wear blankets and people talking about wrapping themselves in electric blankets at their desk rather than being able to he heat their homes i think that you know i've spoken to so many kind of pensioners and people who've called into various radio shows who are talking about you know at the end of the week i've only got less than 10 pounds after my it's absolutely hor horrendous and the government can do more and they should do more jonathan yeah, I mean, I think it's quite telling, isn't it, that we have a panel of left and right people and we all seem to agree on this, and that's a uh, danger for the government. And I suppose we have to remember as well that this cost of living crisis is coming at the end of a series of economic shocks, um, sort of COVID, uh, the B word, and obviously the, the longest uh, stagnation in wages uh, in sort of living memory. And on top of that, we now have, you know, so sort of this new massive crisis. And the government is, is, if you look at what Sunak was announcing in the spring statement, you know, 5p reduction in petrol, which obviously 
obviously disappeared in a second as the 1p income tax not so much jammed tomorrow as you know sort of maybe maybe as of a morsel in two years time it did made no political sense whatsoever while you know refusing say a 500 pound uh, rebate for example on energy bills which are going through the roof and so obviously they need to do more you know universal credit not only reinstating the the, the uplift but increasing it further uh, as you said uh, annabelle sort of you know indexing uh, welfare is you know an excellent idea i could completely support um sort of uh, cutting the you know uh, scrapping the the national insurance uh, rise you know just basic things they could do along with having the windfall tax on on also on an energy companies all this stuff they could do which they're choosing not to do and i think it's very short size on their perspective because people will at the next election look at their pocketbooks they'll look at their wallets and see that they are living a lot less comfortably than they were and a lot more people are going to be in poverty and the only people they can blame for that will be the government justifiably and it's not just looking at their pocketbook absolutely. or looking at their bank statements, absolutely. it's feeling absolutely. it's living it, absolutely. isn't it? It's absolutely yeah. feeling yeah. that yeah. it's funny how their partner's income gets taken yeah. into account and their yeah. universal exactly. credit gets cut, but for some reason the Chancellor's wife, it, her income... You know, it's, it's fundamentally that, it's about fairness, of, isn't it? It's, and about, you kind of, yeah. it's about fairness and it's yeah. about quality of life. Yeah. Of course the deficit matters, of course it does, and, you know, yes, the, these, the, the big money matters, but people matter as well, and it seems that the government are saying, actually, people don't matter, but we've got to... But well, yeah, but we've I mean, got to fill up the coffers. Right, exactly. And two years ago, we saw that when, when push comes to shove, when the government needs to magic up money, the magic money tree actually does exist because there was unlimited funds to help people during COVID and people need help now. So why isn't that help coming? Well, they're not well, doing that because surely, it's... Surely, just to play devil's advocate here, surely just because the magic money tree did exist for COVID, you can't keep shaking it forever and ever. Otherwise, you, you get a basket case economy. But at the moment, we are in a moment of crisis. It's a perfect storm. But that's not true, Ian, because if people have more money in their pockets, they then stimulate the economy. We've got we've seen, some pretty, spend, we've seen some pretty disappointing growth, growth figures today, Ian, actually. So it's not the case that the way in which the Chancellor is currently running the economy is successful. I did so as playing devil's advocate. I know you did. Well, um, I just can I come back on a couple of Annabelle, First, Annabelle will the be growth a figures devil. weren't actually too bad today, and they're certainly not as bad as a lot of people are not making out. If you take out, <laughs> if you take out the NHS test and trace and the vaccine program, it grew 1.1 percent in February, which is more than the OBR was forecasting for the first quarter. So I think. I would just bear that in mind. As In terms of the money printer that's been whirring uh, at the Bank of England over the last couple of years, the massive Since increase... 2007, in, you mean? Well, <laughs> and particularly uh, in 2020 and to a lesser extent in 2021, the massive um, increase in the supply of money that we saw over the coronavirus pandemic is in large part to blame for the fact that we now have inflation set to hit the high single digits. So I think we've got to be very wary of believing the MMT, the um, modern monetary theory uh, dream, or buying into the modern, modern monetary theory dream that we can just continue to print and print and print more money so that everybody we can afford everybody the sort of lifestyle that they want, because it does come with very serious consequences. And this is a problem that the Chancellor himself is facing. Well, we're not even very about frightened lifestyle. about lifestyle. We're not talking about a lifestyle. But we're talking about we people's inflation. Has, needs. But that's inflation. We're talking about it's yeah. people having you know less disposable income, less purchasing power, um, and that that is in large part to blame. The situation right, that we have is in large part to blame because of inflation. No, I was just going to I was just going to make a point about inflation that it's even more significant, isn't it? That this is not demand driven largely inflation. This is cost push inflation that has come from increases in fuel prices which which need to be ameliorated if people aren't going to be finding themselves in the sort of position that they are well, at the moment. It's also, in terms of it, is, it is demand led or, or supply a lack of supply if you have uh, I mean every, yeah, the, the, the economy of the whole world got back on its feet at roughly the same time so therefore there was a huge amount of demand for some products and the no, supply No but my argument there. is this is not an inflation that is being caused by uh, either government fiscal or monetary policy it's largely being caused by increases in costs yeah. whether or not from Brexit or from fuel increase. Well also in putting no, the, the country into lockdown for two years completely unnecessarily <laughs> 
We've done so well to get to 8.47 <laughs> without the Brexit word having been mentioned, particularly given Jonathan is on the panel. It's 8.47. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. Boris Johnson's trip to Kiev. Andrew and Kensington have been an absolute triumph for the British government and the British Prime Minister. It's achieved nothing. No same leader in a major country goes to the war zone. The visit has been vetted by the Russians. No, that's nonsense. Uh, that, that, that's it, I think. I think, I think that's a red card. You, know, you win the award. That's the biggest pile of nonsense for April. You are the worst oh, caller of the month. Uh, what is it? April the what? 11th. You've won the award as the dopiest caller of the month. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. LBC. Having a Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Nine minutes to nine on LBC. Everyone's awaiting our fun text at the end of the programme. That seems to have become a bit culty. Uh, we have Jackie Smith, Emma Wolfe, Annabelle Denham, and Jonathan Liss with us answering your questions. And the next one is from Chris in Richmond. Hello, Chris. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Um, should Hi. we be concerned if, Mad uh, with, if Marine Le Pen becomes Madame Le President in a couple of weeks' time? Emma I think we should be concerned yeah obviously um, I think Macron should be even more concerned about his disaster yesterday I think there's a real sense of anger and betrayal and um, dissatisfaction and alienation amongst the French people and they protest properly they do it properly they're not going to take this lying down um, I think I think Marine Le Pen should be pretty happy with her performance thus far Probably she won't. She won't make it. But I think that um, already she's had a huge surge um, in the polls, and it's already a victory for her. Um, I think that European leaders will be will be nervous about this. The you know the increasing surge towards populism and the the votes for the extreme left and the right uh, were notable. Um, but I think this is a profound rejection of what of what Macron stands for, and he, you know, he came to power promising promising to do it to do things differently, and instead we have just exactly the same. I think French people feel they have just more of the uh, sort of Elysee elitism. Um, Jackie, you were very enamoured with Emmanuel Macron, but um, slightly less so nowadays. I feel. Um, 
Slightly less. I mean, clearly I would have voted for him had I been in France. And Emma, it's not true to say that what happened to him yesterday was a disaster. In fact, he had the best performance of an incumbent president since Mitterrand in 1988. So, uh, and I, I suspect will win uh, in a fortnight when the second round uh, arrives. But to answer the question, yes, I think it would be a disaster if Marine Le Pen became the next uh, French president. It would turn France into an insular, um, unwelcoming backward country and not one that I would want to be living next to. Jonathan. Uh, yeah, I look, I, I'm no fan of Macron, but I think he actually did quite well yesterday considering he kind of increased his first uh, round percentage um, from five years ago. Uh, I think there are a lot of things to say about the election. It's very obviously very worrying that 30% of the population voted for far-right candidates. That's horrifying. It's uh, extremely concerning for centre-left and centre-right parties that, you know, the, the Gaullists and the Socialists who polled over 50% a few years ago now polled 7% between them. That is extraordinary as well. Uh, what it means for centre-left and centre-right parties in Europe. But I think that Macron will win it, but uh, but by a much similar majority uh, than he did five years ago. And that's very concerning about the direction that France is taking. Uh, yes, we would be extremely concerned if Marine Le Pen won. Uh, it would be... Uh, on a, a European equivalent to Trump winning the 2016 US election, uh, which was obviously horrifying in lots of ways and did, you know, sort of cause you know, sort of several earthquakes for the next four years. So that would be awful for France and awful for Europe. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't like Macron as a, as a politician. I don't like his policies. I don't like his style or manner. But clearly, he needs to win. And Europe uh, should, should get behind him, and he does. But I don't think there's anything to celebrate in this election. Annabelle. Yes, really echo what everybody else has, has said there. It would be alarming if Marine Le Pen won this uh, election. She is isolationist, she's protectionist, she's described as far right, but actually it's quite an un unhelpful description of her if you look at a lot of her economic policies. Actually, as it happens, I'm, I think that a lot of what Macron did for the French economy has been quite good, which is why uh, its GDP is now uh, just edged over pre-pandemic levels. Um, he implemented labour market reforms that incentivised hiring and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think it would be very problematic. What I would say is that the, it will be very tight. I imagine it'll be about 52-48 in Macron's favour. And because there's this realignment taking place in France, just like the one we saw here in Britain that led to the B word in 2016, um, the divisions are now on cultural lines rather than economic lines. It's nationalism versus cosmopolitanism. And I think that this could pave the way for Marine Le Pen's niece to come in in five years' time with potentially uh, a landslide. But certainly, at least in the short term, I think we're looking at five more years of Emmanuel Macron. Uh, Madam Editor on Twitter says, Jackie Smith just said everything I was thinking with regards to the French election. Absolutely spot on. Said no one ever. Um, <laughs> let's move on, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, Morgan in Conway in Wales has a question. Hello, Morgan. Hello, Ian. You're right, everyone on the panel. Um, so, two years down the line now since he became Labour leader, does the panel think that Keir Starmer is the modern the modern day Neil Kinnock, or do they think he's the Ed Miliband version too? <laughs> <laughs> or Tony Blair, I suppose. You they both say. lost. Well, exactly. <laughs> That's not a very good choice. Just, just to add another uh, text onto this question, which you can feel free to answer if you wish. Uh, Keir Starmer has suggested Jeremy Corbyn won't be getting the Labour whip back. Is he right? And will that mean a new MP for the good people of Islington North? Um, Annabelle, let's start with you. Uh, I think he's more of an Ed Miliband 2.0 to the first um, question. Uh, I, I, I'm just not convinced that he's going to be leading the Labour Party into the next general election. Now, there may be a, a lack, as there now is with the Conservative Party, of un, oven ready popular candidates to take his place. Um, but it simply it's undeniable now that he lacks the charisma um, and lacks the policy underpinning I think in order to win in, in 2024 I think it's the Conservatives to lose rather than Keir Starmer's uh, to win and the second question what will it mean Jeremy for the good Corbyn. people of Islington North well I, I think given Jeremy Corbyn's majority it'll mean another Labour MP for the foreseeable Jonathan 
I mean, charisma is overrated. I mean, Donald Trump was charismatic for a lot of people. Joe Biden isn't particularly. Uh, so Boris Johnson is charismatic for a lot of people. You know, charisma can be too exhausting, uh, too exciting and entertaining uh, quite often in politics. And sometimes you need someone who's going to be dependable. Look, I don't find Keir Starmer... <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, Keir Starmer is not an inspiring leader. Look, I'm I'm on the left. You know, I, I, I would love to see more left-wing policies. I hope that he does go uh, towards that. But obviously, He's, you know, he's he's trying to, you know, be a bit Blairite in in sort of, you know, being as as right wing as he poss- as his party will allow him to be because he thinks that the centre ground is where elections are won. We'll see if that is correct. Um, but obviously, uh, he has a lot to prove. I think he's uh, done a lot uh, better. He's improved a lot since he since he came into uh, the position. He's enjoying healthy poll leads, which have been sustained over a period of some months now, even uh, during the Ukraine war. And so I think that he has a very good chance of, of making it to the next election. And actually, frankly, he has a good chance of winning it, particularly uh, if, jo- if Johnson stays in position, because the public, as we were saying earlier, does not think highly of him. So I wouldn't write off Starmer at all. I would like him to be bold. I'd like him to sort of get his, his teeth stuck into things. He was very impressive in the party gate thing. And I, and I think that he uh, still uh, has a, a lot that he can offer. Emma? I'm afraid I disagree. I think Keith Starmer Starmer is completely lacking charisma. I think he's very, very bland. I don't think he resonates at all with British people. Um, And I absolutely don't see him winning the next election. Whether whether Labour keep him on um, to lead him into the next election, well, that's their decision. Um, I I just can't believe there isn't anyone more inspiring that who could be leading the Labour Party. So Jackie Smith, Neil Kinnock or Ed Miliband 2.0? Well, as I'm the second oldest member of this panel, <laughs> after you, Ian, oh, um, I... Only uh, by three months. A little, a little bit of political history. I mean, uh, I, I have an, a massive amount of respect for Neil Kinnock because Neil Kinnock essentially made the Labour Party electable again in the 1980s and paved the way for John Smith, and who sadly, of course, died, and then uh, Tony Blair to take Labour into government. Um... Ed Miliband, much as I like Ed, of course, didn't do uh, the same. I think there is a chance that Keir Starmer... I I don't think Keir Starmer will be replaced before the next general election. I think, given some of the momentum that he was getting before, uh, as I said, the Ukraine situation slightly distracted the opposition, meant that he was putting himself in a position where Labour could win uh, the next election. If he isn't successful in doing that, then he is much more Neil Kinnock because I think he will very much have paved the way to making Labour electable again, which it hasn't been for a long and time. And guess who's sitting down with Neil Kinnock for over an hour on Wednesday for an All Talk podcast? Is it you, Ian Dale? Funnily enough, it is. <laughs> right, let's move on to our final text. It's from Ailsa in Hampshire. For the many podcast fans, know what Ian and Jackie will be doing this time next week. <laughs> but what are the rest of the panel's plans for the evening of Easter Monday? Uh, just to clear up any unfortunate gossip that might be uh, promulgated by that text, Jackie and I are doing a live podcast on the Magic Mike stage at the Hippodrome. The Magic Mike? Is that yeah. the, is the with, 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 yes. with, Yeah, with words streeting. Yeah. Are you all getting your kits off? Yeah. No, we all hope <laughs> Wes is. <laughs> Unfortunately, Jonathan, um, you would have to come to find out, but it's sold out within 36 oh, hours. Damn. So, next Easter Monday evening, Emma, what will you be doing? I am doing an Easter egg hunt thing on Easter Monday with my baby boy. Lovely. As you should be. Annabelle? I will also be doing Easter egg hunts with my children who are five and three-year-old twins, so I imagine that next Monday evening I'm going to be trying to wrangle with them, negotiate with them. Five and three-year-old them. twins. 18 months old. Thoughts and prayers. Thank you. <laughs> Jackie, no, you, we know what you're doing. Jonathan? I will be um, strutting myself on the dance floor on Sunday night and sleeping it off on Monday. <laughs> it's not a sight If you need any dance. Well, I mean, counter. well, you know, speak for yourself. <laughs> right. We will move on in the next hour. Thank you to you all, Jonathan, Jackie, Annabelle and Emma. Uh, You'll all be invited back at some point very, very, very soon. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to talk about teachers and why half of teachers plan to leave the profession within five years. Are you one of them? Give me a call, 0345 6060 973. What are the challenges that face modern day teachers that have led so many of you to think, you know what, I don't want to do this job anymore? It's two minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. 
From Global's newsroom, a 26-year-old Islamic State Group supporter has been found guilty of murdering the Conservative MP Sir David Amis in Essex in October last year. Ali Harbi Ali stabbed him more than 20 times with a 12-inch car.